we started out originally thinking that the quilts were the main emphasis of the study, and we soon found that it's the people, the lives of the women, the stories behind the quilts that maybe have become even more important than the quilts themselves. Women were not considered very important in recorded history in the 19th century. As you know, they weren't, weren't even mentioned in the census until quite late in the century. And so uh, even their gravestones might have lost the lettering on them or been broken and disappeared. But the quilts remain, and we think that it's a legacy that all families should cherish and take um, care to protect and pass on to the next generation. The legacy of quilts and the stories that go with them. That was Bets Ramsey of Chattanooga, who, along with Mary Kay Waldvogel of Knoxville, looked at 1,425 quilts in Tennessee during the past two years. From this number, 32 were chosen for the exhibition Quilts of Tennessee, and for the corresponding book Quilts of Tennessee, Images of Domestic Life prior to 1930. The quilt show will travel for the next two years around the state. For Tennessee Kaleidoscope, Mary Kay and Betts told some of the stories about the quilts. Here's Mary Kay. They were applique quilts made in Upper East Tennessee. One of them, the story goes, that it was only used when the minister came to spend the night. Even when the minister slept in the bed, they would take this fancy quilt off and give him a utilitarian quilt to actually sleep under. Now, when you say that, people wonder, why would the minister come to spend the night? But, in fact, that was the time of the circuit riders in Tennessee. And the story of the quilt generates that uh, story of that, that life at that time. Another quilt was saved during the Civil War, that area where a lot of soldiers were, were trooping through, both Confederate and Union soldiers. A lot of soldiers were looting the houses, and the quilts were saved. They were hidden. We heard many, many stories about quilts were saved in tree trunks, or they were saved in... Uh, in a hidden spot in the house, or they were saved in the barn, or they dug holes in the ground and would, would hide the quilt uh, in, the, in the ground, often with the silver, the family silver. And to me, that shows, again, that upheaval of the home life at that time. But it also shows how much they treasured those quilts, and that those quilts are still in the family is a tribute to the maker and to the, uh, the care of the families. More stories from Bets Ramsey. And we have one quilt in the book that is uh, made by a group for a fundraising Confederate effort. It was a raffle quilt, and it was won by a Confederate spy, a woman who uh, sent messages, carried messages down around the Columbia area, and her family inherited this quilt. It has lots of names inscribed on it and uh, really vivid history of the owner and some of the makers. She had lived quite an exciting life and later on made a little pillow out of homespun scraps from her friends, dresses that they had had to make during the Civil War. Um, one of our favorite stories is the Two Wives quilt. This was a quilt that was uh, seen in the Gatlinburg area. A man who had um, a very a fine quilt maker wife uh, lost her in death and after she died he married another woman who could make quilts and she finished the quilt right where the first one left off there's a little change of fabric it's not quite the same color but she matched up her size to the former wife's squares and it turns out to be a very decent quilt and I think he uh, chose his second wife very thoughtfully to make sure he'd have a good provider too. There are a lot of quilts in the exhibition that uh, children had a part in also. There's one quilt that has the little hands of a, of a little girl who was at the feet of the quilt makers uh, when it was being quilted. She at the time was one year old and her little hand prints are covering the quilt. The Quilts of Tennessee show, which opened first at the Museum of Science and Energy in Oak Ridge, goes to Morristown, Chattanooga, Johnson City, and Memphis, with its final stop, Nashville's Parthenon, in 1988. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the WPLN Educational Foundation. This is Lynn Folk.
the project is, is modeled after one that was done in Kentucky. The people there went around the state going to small towns, asking people to bring out their quilts, and they recorded the history on the quilts, and they took pictures of them, and eventually a book and an exhibition was uh, put together, and that exhibition has traveled around the country, even outside of the country. It, it generated so much interest in the area of quilt research that other states have done the same thing. In Tennessee, Mary Kay Waldvogel and Bets Ramsey decided to collect quilts which were made before 1930. Also, they wrote a book, The Quilts of Tennessee, Images of Domestic Life Prior to 1930. In a previous Tennessee Kaleidoscope program, some of the stories these quilts had to tell. Today, more about the quilts of Tennessee and how they were located. We didn't have any trouble at all finding quilts. We ended up seeing 1,425 quilts, and we've got slides on all of them and the history. There, a two-page form was filled out on each quilt that includes the oral history and then also the technical data on the quilts. You say this is before 1930. It seems to me that interest in quilts lagged a little bit, say from the 30s up until the 50s. Well, there was a, uh, a quilt exhibit done at the Whitney Museum in the early 70s in New York. And at that point, when quilts were taken out of the cedar chest and out of the closets and put on the wall in a major gallery in New York City, we can date back to that point for the explosion in the interest of antique quilts. And soon after that, of course, was the bicentennial, and people began to make quilts in earnest. People are still making lots and lots of new quilts. Mary Kay said that we were looking for the typical Tennessee quilt. Well, we found out there is no such thing. We saw such a variety of quilts, and we had to uh, really choose with care because our exhibition is to be what is typical of the things we saw. We were concerned that we had a fair geographic distribution and that we did balance out the different types of quilts. We also wanted to know something about the history of the quilt, that is the family history, and very fortunately almost every quilt in the show does belong to the family of the original maker. And then we were looking for those unique quilts, the ones that were uh, very inventive or ones that had perhaps a special history to them. So we tried to cover and balance all of this out and wrote letters to prospective lenders and were very, very fortunate to have almost all of them agree to let us borrow their quilts for a couple of years. Well, I'm sure they're honored to have their quilts in the are. show. Too. Yes, I think they are. And I, I think some of them were surprised that their quilts were historical treasures. Another aspect of the project is our wonderful volunteer help. We managed to find a local coordinator each time we were having a quilt day, and that person was responsible for finding a building. Uh, we had churches and schools and community centers and just a vast variety of places where we could meet and they would arrange for the location and for getting volunteers to come in and help. And then we appeared with our paraphernalia on that day and set up and trained the volunteers for a little while before the people brought their quilts in to be seen. We usually averaged around 60 to 70 quilts a day, and that involved taking the genealogical material from the family, and then the photography was done, and then we took all sorts of descriptive detail of each quilt. And all this time, these wonderful volunteers were going around and helping us. The exhibition traveling around the state, we hope it's going to generate more interest in documentation days. And somehow during this, we're going to try to do more quilt days when people can bring their quilts to have documented. Mary Kay Waldvogel and Bets Ramsey visited some 30 Tennessee counties while assembling the Quilts of Tennessee show, which is sponsored by the Hunter Museum of Art in Chattanooga. The exhibition goes to Rose Center in Morristown, to the Hunter in Chattanooga, the Carol Reese Museum in Johnson City, the Memphis Pink Palace, and Nashville's Parthenon. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the HCA Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Hospital Corporation of America. This is Lynn Folk.
anything Kingsport per capita, there's more interest there than a lot of places that you'll find, and I like to think that I'm partially responsible for it. Uh, I've been around the area a long time, and of course I've taught, uh, have a lot of students. Uh, matter of fact, there's several of the people here in this show that are ex-students of mine, and uh, I like to think maybe I help create a little interest there, and uh, along with the fact that uh, Kingsport is a fluent place, and uh, you have a lot of people that are interested in art. Raymond Williams' artwork may be found in a number of homes, businesses, and institutions in the United States, and there's one painting seen everywhere that there's a telephone in Kingsport. His painting of Bay's Mountain on the cover of the 1986 Kingsport telephone book. And on the Greenville telephone book, a painting of Davy Crockett's birthplace. He's a popular exhibitor at art shows throughout the country, and I talked with him for Tennessee Kaleidoscope at the Freedom Hall Art Show in Johnson City. He lives in Kingsport, and his gallery is located in the geographic center of the Tri-Cities area between Bristol, Kingsport, and Johnson City. It's Gallery 81 on Highway 81. Well, I built this building particularly for an art gallery. Usually what people do, they find a building that suits the atmosphere of the art and this type of thing, and they set up a little gallery and go in business in that respect. But I built it with the idea of building a gallery, and I designed it uh, to the point where it was more fitting for a gallery. But the fact is it gives me a place that... I can use as a headquarters and at the same time have a sales outlet and visit other parts of the state as well as other states. And I do a lot of shows uh, around about, uh, I go as far as Ann Arbor, Michigan, or uh, uh, even Pennsylvania and places like that, Florida. I go to Sanibel, Florida usually in wintertime and do a show down there in Venice. And the gallery itself serves as a headquarter. Tell me a little bit about your career, uh, where, where you received your art training and some of the things you've done. Well, uh, I first started out by going to school uh, in Chicago, Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, this was uh, generally a school for commercial training. I wanted to be a cartoonist, but I found out what a tough feel that was to break and so I kind of gave up on that after a little while and I went more toward the commercial aspects of it and after I got out of school I went to work for uh, Tennessee Eastman, Division of Eastman Kodak as a commercial artist and I decided I wanted to get into the fine arts field. I gradually got enough nerve to decide I, that's what I was going to do. <laughs> so I uh, left uh, very stable job and went into an uncertain field of the fine arts. What media do you work in and then what are uh, most of your uh, subjects? Well, uh, most of my work is in watercolor and it's more in the realistic uh, field, landscape, uh, wildlife, uh, just a little bit of everything really. If it's paintable, I paint it and I use a lot of different techniques and I even get into some uh, impressionistic stuff as well as the more realistic. And what are some of these different techniques? Sometimes I'll work strictly wet into wet and other times it'll be more of a dry brush type thing and then I'll get into uh, uh, some almost abstract type things by using shrink wrap on my paint while it's still wet and then apply heat to it and come up with some very odd texture and it creates a lot of interest and I have won some awards doing that type of work. This maybe attracts more attention, the uh, question about how it's done than the actual work, but anyway, it's rather interesting and eye-appealing. For Tennessee Homecoming 86, Kingsport artist Raymond Williams was commissioned by a radio station in the area to paint the Elizabethton Covered Bridge, train stations in Kingsport and Bristol, and the amphitheater at East Tennessee State University in Johnson City. These were distributed as limited edition prints and Making a telephone call in Kingsport or Greenville? First, check the cover of the telephone books for two of Raymond Williams' paintings. Tennessee Kaleidoscope made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and HCA, the philanthropic arm of Hospital Corporation of America. This is Lynn Folk.
the early potter here who helped set up our pottery studio was Ernie Wilson, Ernest Wilson. He was an early ceramist, originally from Liverpool, Ohio, moved to TVA to work in ceramic pieces for TVA in the 30s came to the art center, gave us his molds, which we have preserved over the years, and are now producing pieces from these molds. The molds and pieces made from them are at the Oak Ridge Museum of Fine Arts, and uh, Tennessee Kaleidoscope features Caroline Weaver, director of the art center, talking about these ceramics of historical interest. Fifty-one years ago, in conjunction with the building of Norris Dam, TVA established an experimental ceramics laboratory to test American whiteware clays and uh, to attempt to build an electrically fired kiln, which would be both practical and economical. The commercial ceramics industry looked on this project as impossible. However, the finest, most technically perfect true porcelain ever produced, using only indigenous American clays, was first made in Norris, Tennessee. Master potter Ernest Wilson's major contributions at the research laboratory were in testing and modeling the clay, also testing the firing by the electric kiln being developed. Later, he moved uh, to Oak Ridge to become one of the founders of the Oak Ridge Art Center Ceramic Studio. He died in 1968, but his influence continued with potters of the area. He was an enthusiastic teacher, and it helped many of our people in Oak Ridge to become potters of some quality. Some of Ernest Wilson's students are now instructors at the Art Center. The molds from his private collection were given to the Oak Ridge Center. Most of them are in excellent condition. The porcelain clay was tested in these molds for purity, translucency, and releasing quality. They're utilitarian objects, chocolate pots, creamers, sugars, vases, and dishes, and in earlier days these were presented to noted visitors to TVA at Norris. Lithoplane lamps were popular gifts, and a tea set was given to the First Lady. One of the teapots was made for Eleanor Roosevelt, and I think that everyone will want one of these Eleanor Roosevelt teapots, <laughs> but they are very difficult to make and time-consuming but fascinating work. Uh, and then we have a uh, ceramic bust of Ernie Wilson himself, and we also have a lamp base which was given to celebrities and politicians who would stop at TVA to visit the Norris Dam in the early days. And on this lamp base is a picture of Franklin Roosevelt. On the base, uh, some wording? Yes, it says it's from Norris, Tennessee, and the date's in the 30s, 36, I believe, 1936. Caroline Weaver, director of the Oak Ridge Community Arts Center, plans are being made for the exhibit to be seen elsewhere. We're hoping that we can arrange for this show to be a traveling show, and I think it would be of great interest in this area, in the state of Tennessee, especially the, the area where the TVA dams are uh, built. You have the molds, his personal molds, here at the museum, and then you're going to reproduce from those molds and make objects. That is correct. Uh, Ernie Wilson gave us his molds uh, while he was a potter here, and there are over 24 molds, but molds do gradually deteriorate so that... Uh, these pieces which are produced from these molds are going to have some value, historic value, and uh, they are attractive as well. TVA's association with the ceramic laboratory at Norris was brief. In 1938, after judging the experiment a success, the Bureau of Mines took over. The emphasis changed uh, to other mineral experiments, and the porcelain testing was discontinued. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the WPLN Educational Foundation. This is Lynn Folk. Up at Washington, they'd get out looking under the quilt for people to come by, and they'd say, where's your knots at? I said, well, you have to pull your knots through. You go up and under it with your needle and pull the knot up. Take a hole your line and let it come tricks the line in the cotton. And then you start quilting. Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Nora Crabtree Ladd of Kingston, Tennessee. 
When she was selected to be one of four quilters at the 1986 Smithsonian's Festival of American Folklife in Washington, which featured Tennesseans, she couldn't believe it. But she knew the invitation was real when she was asked if she could bring her quilt frames to Washington. She said she couldn't do that because the frames wouldn't fit in her car. And then she was asked for instructions so the frames could be made up there. I told her, well, when I got up there, they had them, four pieces, and they had them nailed solid on each end. And when I got there, I said, them will never work. I said, they'll never work. And uh, they won't know why. I said, got to have holes in them, so far apart, to roll your quilt. And uh, you can't roll a quilt if you get a, st a reach done. And you got to have your quilt where you can roll it and then stick it in them holes. And they had to take it apart. And there's a man there that had no time to drill. And he went and got it and come down there and drilled it. He was there just like we was, and he drilled the holes first. And the man come and cut them off. There's, and they had them sitting on horses. I said, well, I couldn't, you couldn't work them. And the lady up here at the newspaper said, well, Miss Ladd, what are you going to do if you get up there and they're not right? I said, I'll make them right. And that's what I done. Well, had, had you been to Washington before? No, ma'am, I hadn't never been there. It's just wonderful. Just, I don't know, it, I was just thrilled after I got there. I got nervous beforehand, but after that, I had a wonderful time. Nora Ladd has a scrapbook filled with pictures and mementos from her 10-day experience in Washington, where she and some 90 Tennesseans demonstrated to the nation the folk arts of the state. And there was time to see national monuments and museums and enjoy all the entertainment on the mall, even though most of the time was spent in working. Her daily appearances officially began in the late morning, but she was always out there earlier. We weren't supposed to have been out till 11, but we'd go by 8, because uh, it was so hot. We'd go early. And people just circulated around and watched you work. And it liked to burn us up. But it wasn't hot on us until they'd gang up so much. And they'd have us to show them. There's a man. He said, I'm a quilter but I don't know how to turn my corners and get them fixed like that. He said, could you show me? And I showed him how to turn them. And so people were there from all over the country, I oh, know. Oh, Lord, the names in that book, all oh, that they give us, I never see the like in my life. Melbourne, Mexico, Texas, Michigan. I can't call them out unless I read them. And you, you were <laughs> doing this work uh, under, a under, under a tent? Under a tent. And... Uh, They'd come by and asked us, and we had some stars that, uh, see, they had me to bring, cut a lot of pieces and sew some of them together and bring the pieces to show them how to put them together. And one lady asked us for two of the stars, and we give them to her. Star-shaped pieces, are they? Uh, pieces, uh, just one star cut to show her how to cut them and, and put them together. But they all fell in love with my lone star. I just had half of it done. The Lone Star design is one of the latest of hundreds of quilts she's made since she began in 1920. And here she tells what it was like to be a quilter then and where her calico cloth came from. We had a little store down here. You could buy 10 cents a yard. And I'd get, save up my eggs and take them to the store. Four dozen eggs bought four yards. And uh, we'd sell chickens, take it and get, some, get stuff with it. And then how did you get your cotton? Used to raise cotton. Mm. And then uh, I'd card it. I'd put my lining up, and then I'd sit at night and card my cotton till I'd get enough to cover that lining, and then I'd put my top on and quilt it. How thick was the cotton yeah, padding? As thick as what you buy now, but it's a whole lot softer. Lord, I picked cotton, set, we'd set, put it out before the fireplace, and they'd get warm, and you'd pick the seed out of it. And we'd sit at night and pick the seed out of it, and then I'd card it. You know, when you pick cotton, it's just a big bunch. Well, you see, it's level and straight when you card it. Nora Crabtree Ladd of Kingston is still quilting after some 66 years. Her house is filled with quilts, and her family and friends enjoy them, too. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the WPLN Educational Foundation. This is Lynn Folk.
our program uh, is very diverse throughout the year. We have a real rich history in the Gatlinburg area. We are open year-round and provide a, a different kind of art and craft education than you find in most places. Um, we are a visual arts center with a full-time gallery, and our gallery exhibitions change um, every month to two months. Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Debbie Johnson, staff assistant at the Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg, which was founded in the early part of the century as a settlement school. Now it's a prestigious, nationally known visual arts center for contemporary and also traditional arts and crafts, and its workshops are most popular. The workshops uh, that we're most well known for are Spring and Workshop Program, which are one and two week workshops in a variety of different media, including clay, fabric, blacksmithing, metals, jewelry, photography, textile printing, weaving, just about any kind of media in the art and craft area you could, could find. We also offer the traditional painting and drawing type classes, and uh, most of the classes have a, a contemporary approach to them. We do teach some very traditional forms of craft, like split oak basketry and um, those types of things, but we are trying to provide contemporary art and craft education to the people who want to come here. The one and two week workshops are scheduled in the entire month of March and then through the summer from um, the second week in June through the middle of August. Our faculty come in from all over the country. They are usually from university settings or studio settings. Most of them are very well known within their own areas and within the art world. And our students come from all over the country and even some foreign countries. Um, when we're in session, we usually have in the summer seven or eight classes going at one time. So on campus you would have up to 100, 120 people. And it's quite an exciting environment when we're in session because the classes interact with each other and although you may come to take a pottery class, you get to walk through the, the weaving studio and see what the weavers are doing or walk up to blacksmithing or you know go through photography or something else. The workshops are hands-on. The students are in the studios from nine in the morning until we lock up at midnight every night. Um, the studios open early, they open at 6.30 and the people are working in there most of that time. Sessions for elder hostel students are also offered for two weeks each year. These plan for people over the age of 60. And Aramont is frequently the scene of important national and international conferences. Last fall, we had the first national wood turning conference held in this country. The leading turners in the country came here and gave demonstrations, and we had about 250 participants. They came from Ireland, England, Australia, and it was just wonderful to be on the the front end of a craft like that that is really taking off as far as being accepted in the art world. All of this far removed from the early days of Aramont when it was founded by Pi Beta Phi National Women's Fraternity. But even now, some of the original buildings remain on campus. In 1912, the Pi Phi's who still support the school came to the area. They had done a, uh, a survey to find out where educational facilities were needed and Sevier County was in need of education and public health. They came here to this impoverished mountain community and built a settlement school. And the students came down from the mountains and lived on campus. And they provided traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they also provided um, farming skills, home economic skills. And at that time, the, they realized that there were a lot of rich handicrafts being done in the area. And a lot of things were dying out, such as weaving. They hired a weaving designer to come in and go back into the mountain homes and kind of revive that art form. So added to the curriculum were weaving, broom making, woodworking. So the craft roots were very early in the settlement school. The Pi Fi's had an active hand in public health and education on up through the mid-60s. They also provided a nurse that rode back, horseback into the mountains and treated the people in the area, and she set up kind of a wellness clinic here, and that's one of our buildings still on campus, too. But um, there's still many people in the area still remember being students at the settlement school and coming here, and uh, our blacksmithing studio was the old chicken coop from the farm. A lot of the old buildings are still here, and a lot of those roots are still here among the people of the area. Debbie Johnson at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the HCA Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Hospital Corporation of America. This is Lynn Folk.